Namaskaram. Uh, today I'm going to be talking about the 11th paragraph of Nana. Before I do so, I will first uh, briefly go through the, the 10th paragraph, which I spoke about last time, because these two paragraphs are um, they're both dealing with the same subject, which is the subject of uh, Vishaya Vasanas. Vishaya Vasanas means Vishayas are phenomena, objects. Anything other than ourself is a Vishaya. Um, and Vasana means inclination. So our inclination to attend to and to experience anything other than ourself is a Vishaya Vasana. And so long as, and Vishaya Vasanas, obviously, they're Ego's Vishaya Vasanas. That is, when we don't rise as ego in sleep, there are no Vishaya Vasanas. When we rise as ego, since the nature of ego, as Bhagavan explained in verse 25 of Uludrinapadu, the nature of ego is always to grasp form. As he says, grasping form, it comes into existence. Grasping form, it stands. Grasping and feeding on form, it flourishes abundantly, leaving form, it grasps form. So the very nature of ego is to grasp form. And form means, again, it means any phenomena, whether seemingly physical or a mental phenomena, all phenomena are forms of one kind or another. So in other words, form is, means the same as the share. So since, since ego cannot stand or flourish without, it cannot rise, stand or flourish without grasping form, as ego, we naturally have a uh, have strong inclination to grasp form, to attend to things other than ourselves. So when we want to turn within, these yeah. are the obstacles. That is, though we may have some liking to turn within, most of us have much greater liking to attend to other things. So we, in this practice of self-investigation, we are trying to wean our mind of its inclination to attend to other things and to strengthen the inclination to attend to ourself. That inclination to attend to ourself is what Bhagavan called sat vasana. That is the, the inclination just to be, the being, the being inclination, the inclination just to know and to be what we actually are. Or we can say the inclination to attend to our being, to attend only to I am. So, but, the nature of vasanas, as Bhagavan explained, the more we allow ourselves to be swayed by any vasana, the stronger that vasana becomes. The more we refrain from being swayed by any vasana, the weaker it becomes. So vasanas are just inclinations. We are not bound by our in inclinations. We may have inclinations to do certain things, but we we are not we, we it's up to us whether we allow our mind to follow the inclinations or not so so long as we have uh, as our vishaya vasanas are still relatively strong and our sat vasana is still relatively weak it seems to us to be a, a struggle to hold on to self attentiveness though bhagavan has told us that actually this is the easiest of all practices and logically, that is obviously so. What, what, what is more obvious than I? So attending to I shouldn't be difficult. The reason it seems difficult is because we, we are not willing to let go of other things. In other words, we're not willing to surrender ourselves. So this subject of Vishaya Vasanas goes right to the heart of Bhagavan's teachings, because Bhagavan's teachings are all about self-investigation. That's attending only to I. That is our aim. Because only by attending to ourselves can we know what we actually are. Uh, so that's just a brief summary of the subject. I'll just quickly go through paragraph 10, just to remind, uh, what, what Bhagavan, uh, to remind us all what Bhagavan said in paragraph 10. And then the main subject is paragraph 11. In the first sentence mm -hmm. of Bhagavan, or, or paragraph 10, Bhagavan says, even though Vishaya Vasanas, which come from time immemorial, rise in countless numbers like ocean waves, they will all be destroyed when Swarupa Dhyana increases and increases. Swarupa Dhyana, Swarupa means our own nature, our own, our real nature, what we actually are. And Dhyana means meditation. So Swarupa Dhyana means meditation on our real nature. In other words, self-attentiveness, attending only 
to our fundamental awareness of our own existence, I am. That is Swarupa Dhyana. So, for, as he says here, but when Swarupa Dhyana increases and increases, what he means by increases and increases is increases in, in depth and intensity and in duration. That the more we try to attend to ourselves, the more the, the vasanas will be weakened and eventually destroyed. Um, that is, all vasanas other than the sat vasana, all the vishaya vasanas will be weakened and destroyed. And then in the next sentence, he says, um, without giving room even to a doubting thought, uh, uh, putting an end to so many vasanas, is it possible to remain or to be only as Swarupa, as our real nature, rather than giving, without giving room to such thoughts, it is necessary to cling tenaciously to self-attentiveness. That is, it doesn't matter what the thought is, all thoughts are allowing our attention to go away from ourselves. So without giving room to the thought, or is it possible, it my, I, my vasanas are so strong, how can I put an end to them all? How can I just be as I am? We shouldn't even give room to that thought. We need just to cling tenaciously to self-attentiveness. And... Um, in Tamil, the, the, the main clause of this sentence is Swarupa Dhyanate Vidha Pidi Pidika Vendum. That is a very, very st strong way of saying it. It is necessary to cling to uh, the, I translate Vidha Pidi as tenaciously, but it is even tenaciously, though it's a strong adverb in English, it doesn't quite convey the. the the force of what Bhagavan says in Tamil, that is that vidā pidi um, vidā means not leaving, pidi means holding. So, um, unleavingly, holdingly, holding is, is we can trans if it's translated literally. So, it, it's it very, very strongly Bhagavan said we just have to be, hold on tenaciously to self attentiveness. That's all that's necessary. And then in the next sentence, he says. Uh, this is the third and last sentence of this paragraph. He says, however great a sinner one may be, if instead of lamenting and weeping, I am a sinner, how am I going to be saved? If one completely gives up the thought that one is a sinner and is steadfast in self-attentiveness, in Swarupa Dhyana, one will certainly be reformed. Or, or that is the, the term he uses in Tamil for be reformed is Urupaduban. Um, that literally means one will take form. It's a term that is used for, for, for uh, to me, in the sense of reform or transform. It imp what it implies in this context is we will be transformed into what we actually are. In other words, we'll remain as we actually are if we cling tenaciously to self-attentiveness. Um, so Bhagavan is very, very forceful here, but we have to, it doesn't matter what other thoughts come, it doesn't matter how bad a sinner we are, how strong our vasanas may be, the only way to move forward is to cling to self-attentiveness. It doesn't matter how many times our attention slips away from ourselves towards other things, we bring it back to ourselves. Whatever else appears, it appears because we've allowed our attention to move out away from ourselves. So how to bring our attention back to ourselves? To whom has it appeared? It's appeared only to me. So instead of attending to what has appeared, we attend to ourselves, the one to whom it has appeared. So we have to be so tenacious in this practice. And then he continues this subject in the 11th paragraph, which is the main paragraph I'm uh, talking about today. Um, in the first sentence, he says, Manatin kan edu vareil vishaya vasane gal iru kindranavo adu vareil nana ennum vicharaneum vendum. That means uh, as long as vishaya vasanas exist within the mind, so long is the investigation who am I necessary. So, how long will vishaya vasanas exist within the mind? So long as we rise as ego. Uh, it's inevitable that we have Vishaya Vasan to a greater or lesser extent. So, uh, so the implication here is so long as we continue to rise as ego, so long as we have and consequently have the least inclination 
to attend to or to experience anything other than ourselves, so long this investigation, who am I, is necessary. In other words, we need to persevere in this investigation until ego is completely eradicated, along with all its vasanas. And the vasanas obviously cannot remain without ego because they're ego's vasanas, ego's inclinations. And as, so long as ego remains, to a greater or lesser extent, it will still have the share of asana. So we have to persevere in this practice until we are willing to surrender ourselves completely and merge forever back into our source and to lose ourselves in that infinite clarity of pure awareness that is ever shiny in our heart as I am I. Um, and then in the next sentence, he says, Ninevugal uh, tondra tondra, Apode kapode, avegale elam utpatistana tileye, vicharaneal nasipikavendum. That means, as and when thoughts appear, then and there it is necessary to annihilate them all by vicharana, that's by self investigation or self attentiveness, in the very place from which they rise. When Bhagavan uses the term thought, uh, or term, terms in Tamil that mean thought, he's not using it in a narrow sense. And of, often we, we use the term thought in a very narrow sense. We tend to think of uh, the mental chatter that is going on in our mind of thoughts. But that is what the sense in which Bhagavan uses the term thought is all mental phenomena are thoughts. So all thoughts, perceptions, memories, um, feelings, emotions, likes, dislikes, desires, all these, all are only thoughts. In fact, according to Bhagavan, the whole world is nothing but thoughts because this world is just a projection of our mind. Just like the, the world we see in a dream is just a, a mental fabrication. It doesn't exist independent of our perception of it. it it's, only, it's only in our own mind that we have projected it and that we are perceiving it. So everything that we see in a dream is just thought. It's all just mental phenomena. Likewise, everything that we perceive in the waking state is just mental phenomena. In other words, all what seem to us to be physical phenomena are actually just mental phenomena. As Bhagavan says in um, in verse 6 of Uludunapadu, the world is nothing but the five kinds of, of sense impression. In other words, sight, sounds, um, uh, uh, tactile sensation, tastes, and smells. Uh, they're Andrew. It's nothing else. It's nothing other than these. So there's no... If you remove all these five kinds of sense impressions, where is any world? So the world is just these five kinds of sense impression. And sense impressions are mental impressions. So they're, in other words, they're mental phenomena. So for Bhagav according to Bhagavan, everything other than the pure awareness I am, which is what we actually are, everything else is just a thought. Even the one who is aware of all other thoughts is itself a thought. The one who is aware of all other thoughts is ego, which is what Bhagavan often called the first thought I. That is, the thought called I means ego, and it's the first, as Bhagavan often said, it's the first thought to arise. No, only after th this thought I arises do all other thoughts rise. Why? Because all other thoughts exist only in the view of this first thought I. So the ego, the thought I, is, is it's a thought, but it's fundamentally unlike all other thoughts, because all other thoughts are jada, that is, they have no awareness of their own. The only thought that is endowed with awareness is this first thought I. So all other thoughts exist only in the view of this first thought. So no other thought can rise except in the view of ego. So when he says here, as and when thoughts appear, he means as and when anything other than ourself appears, that any phenomena, that whatever it may be, it's all just thought. And as and, so whatever may appear, then and there, we, it's necessary to annihilate what has appeared by self-investigation in the very place from which they rise. 
what does he mean by in the very place from which they rise? That is all, that is all, all other thoughts arise only from ego. It's only, it's only uh, ego who is projecting and experiencing all other thoughts. So all thoughts arise from ego and ego arises only from our real nature, what we actually are. So the very place from which all thoughts rise is ultimately just ourself, our, that fundamental awareness I am. So um, annihilating them in the very place from which they rise means we cling to self-attentiveness, so we, we attend to I am so keenly that we don't allow our attention to be distracted away from ourselves. If we don't allow our self, uh, attraction to be uh, distracted away from ourselves, as soon as any thought rises, it will be destroyed because we're not, we're, we're not following it. The, the, what Bhagavan talks about here is the thoughts. They are all the sprout, sprouting of the vishaya vasanas. That is, vasanas of the inclination to attend to other things. If we allow ourselves to be swayed by the inclination to attend to other things, they rise in the form of thoughts. So when he says, as and when thoughts appear, that means as and when our attention gets, even to the slightest extent, distracted away from ourselves towards anything else, it is necessary to destroy that inclination to attend to other things by turning our attention back to ourselves. By just, that is annihilating them in the very place from which they rise. Um, he said, in Tamil, the way he says, uh, the very place from which they rise, he said, Utpati Stana. Utpati means the place, means rising. Stana means place. Utpati Stana Tileye is a very emphatic way of saying in that very place. So in the, at the place from which they appear, we have to crush them. Um, uh, um, an analogy I sometimes give, um, that, that is, in order to, uh, when, we, when, we, uh, when we prevent other thoughts from rising by clinging firmly to self-attentiveness, we're also uh, bringing about the subsidence of ego. Uh, an analogy I sometimes use for ego, the nature of ego is such that if we don't attend to it, it will, it will be looking outwards, facing other things. When we turn its attention back on itself, it will subside back into its source. So an analogy I sometimes give to describe this, if you have a, a small bunny rabbit, it, 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 if it comes out of its burrow, there are so many dangers in the outside world. There are foxes and wolves and all sorts of uh, predators. So... But the nature of a bunny is to be very playful. So it comes, it comes hopping out to play. But as soon as it becomes aware that anything, any, any other creature is watching it, it senses the danger and it goes back into its hole. Likewise, ego, when we don't watch it, it will be coming out and doing all sorts of mischief. If we watch it, it retreats back into its hole. So in order to prevent ego from rising, and when ego rises, it rises along with all other thoughts. We need to vigilantly attend to the source from which it rises. This is like if, if a bunny rabbit has come out of its hole and is uh, hopping here and there, if you look at it, it retreats back into its hole. Then what do you have to do? You have to continue looking at the, at the mouth of its, of, uh, of its burrow, of its hole, and it will be waiting in there, it will be looking outside. If it sees that someone is looking at it, it will remain inside the burrow. Likewise with ego. If we vigilantly attend to ourselves, ego will not rise. And if ego doesn't rise, other thoughts won't rise. So keeping a vigilant uh, watch on our fundamental awareness of our own being, I am, this is the way to prevent the rising of ego, and consequently the rising of all other thoughts. So what Bhagavan implies here when he says, as and when thoughts appear, then and there, it is necessary to annihilate them all uh, by vicharana in the very place from which they rise, he means we should be attending to our source. What is our source? Our source is the, the, the place from which we rise is... Um, is 
that fundamental awareness I am, what we actually are is only that that fundamental awareness I am, that pure awareness of our own being, that is what we need to attend to. By attending to that, we are thereby uh, uh, preventing the rising of ego and annihilating all other thoughts. If other thoughts rise, then they lead our, they draw our attention away. The other thoughts rise because we've allowed our attention to go away from ourselves. That is the, the bunny rabbit has come out to play. So we need to look at it very vigilantly, we'll retreat back into the burrow, and we need to continue watching the entrance of that burrow to make sure that it doesn't come out. Um, so what, what Bhagavan has taught us is actually an extremely simple practice. But to all, we generally think, or oh, this self-investigation is very difficult, it's very difficult to be self-attentive. The reason it is difficult to be self-attentive is that we prefer to come out and play rather than uh, rather than vigilantly watch ourselves. Um, so it, it is all a matter. That is why Bhagavan often said, Bhakti is the mother of jnana. That is the key to success in this path is love. Love is what is called bhakti. So we must have great love to know and to be what we actually are. Only only by means of that great love to know and to be what we actually are, will we be able to overcome all the vishayavasana, the inclinations to attend to other things. Um, then, in the, uh, so, so Bhagavan is, is as I say, he's, 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 he's emphasizing so strongly that what we need to do is just to be vigilantly self-attentive, to attend to the source from which we've risen. That is, that fundamental awareness I am. If we do so, so long as we are firmly holding on to that self-attentiveness, there'll be no scope for any other thoughts to rise. If other thoughts rise, it means our attention has gone away from ourselves. So what do we do? We bring it back to ourselves. Um, then in the next sentence, he gives a definition of veragya. He, talk, he uses two terms here, veragya and nirasa. Asa means desire, nirasa means desirelessness. Uh, Veragya also means desirelessness. It, um, raga means passion, implying passionate desire, or, or any passionate interest in anything else other than ourself, uh, or indeed any interest in anything other than ourself is a form of raga. Viraga means being free of raga. Veragya is the state in which one is free of uh, raga. So being free of uh, likes and dislikes, being free of desire or any interest in anything other than ourselves. That is veragya, and that is also nirasa. So what the definition that Bhagavan gives here of veragya or nirasa is anyate nada dirital veragyam aladu nirase. That means not attending to anything other is veragya or nirasa. Anything other means anything other, implies anything other than oneself. So not attending to anything other than I, that is veragya. Um, the the, the uh, uh, word he uses for not attending is nada dirtal. If we split it up, na, uh, the nadu means to attend or to uh, investigate, and nadadu means not attending to or not investigating. Iratal literally means being. So being without attending to anything other than ourselves, that is veragya or nirasa. But generally, nada diratal, we can sim uh, uh, I mean, though being is, in, is, is there, we, it's usually, we would normally translate it as not attending, but very literally, if we translate it, it's being not attending or being without attending. In other words, just being as we actually are without attending to anything else. Attending to something other than ourself is the rising of ego. Not attending to anything other than ourself is just being, summa irupudu. Um, so this practice of uh, this practice of self investigation is not a doing; it's a, it's a state of just being, being what we actually are. Because attending to anything other than ourselves 
is a doing because it's a movement of our attention away from ourselves towards something else. So all action begins from this movement of our attention away from ourselves to other things. If we don't allow our attention to move away towards anything else by holding it on, by holding, by by holding on to self-attentiveness, by, by, by holding our attention on ourself alone, that is not an action. That is a, a subsidence of all action. That is just a state of being. That's why Bhagavan says, nada dirital, the being, he, 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 he often mentions that. Um, and then in the next sentence, he says, tane vidada dirital uh, jnanam. Uh, that means... Uh, being without leaving oneself or not leaving oneself is jnana. Jnana means um, knowledge or awareness. So the real awareness is only the state in which we don't leave ourselves. So if, if we are holding on to self-attentiveness, we're thereby not allowing ourselves to attend to anything else. So uh, not leaving ourselves and not attending to anything else are one and the same thing. So in the next sentence, Bhagavan says, Unmail irendum andre. In truth, the two are one. That implies these two, Vairagya and Jnana, are one and the same thing. So to the extent to which we hold on to self-attentiveness, we are thereby not allowing our attention to move away towards anything else. That is Jnana and that is Vairagya. And then in the next sentence, he gives a very nice analogy, which I think probably we're all familiar with. Um, he, the analogy he gives is um, that in Tamil, he says, Muttu koli po tam ideil kalle kati kondu murki kadal adeil kidekum mutte epidi edu kindrano epidi kira. Kiragalo, um, Apadie, Oruvanum, uh, Veragia Tudan, Tanul, Andu Murki, uh, uh, Atma Mutte, Adealam. What, what that means is just as pearl divers tying stones to their waist and sinking pick up pearls that are found at the bottom of the ocean, so each one sinking deep within oneself with Vairagya, um, may obtain the pearl of oneself. Um, the, uh, so the, the, the analogy is that Bhagavan is comparing a Vairagya to the stones that uh, pearl divers tie to their waist. That is, pearl divers cannot sink deep enough to reach the bottom where the pearls lie without are tying stones to their waist so that that the stones are essential. Once they pick up the pearl, then the stones are no longer necessary. But in order to reach the pearls, they need that uh, veragia. They need that, sorry, they need the stone tied to their waist. So Bhagavan uses that as an analogy. We need to have this, we need to be weighed down by the stone of veragia. That is, we need to have, we need to be so free from any inclination to attend to anything other than ourself, then only we're able to sink deep enough within to attain the pearl, the atmamuttu, that means the pearl, the self-pearl, the pearl that is ourself. In other words, to experience, we, we'll be able to know what we actually are only by sinking deep within ourselves, by not attending to anything other than ourselves, by attending only to ourselves, by attending to ourselves so firmly that we don't allow our attention to go away towards anything else. So again, question, they, 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 sorry, question. Mr. yes, uh, about this very topic. And yes, certainly, certainly. Is it okay? Yes, certainly, certainly. Um, I, the question keeps coming into my mind, but how practical is this? But how practical is this? And uh, one comment, you added a new wrinkle today because you've talked about this topic before having to do with how necessary it is to annihilate the thoughts. Today, you added a new wrinkle, well, a couple of new wrinkles, <laughs> that one you're just talking about, plus the one having to do with other phenomena, which in and of itself is thoughts too, but they're distinct in one respect. As and when thoughts arise, it's necessary to annihilate them. I've I've read and I've heard mm. you say and I've heard you explain it, which is tough all by itself. Yeah. 
all mental phenomena you included in uh, memories, feelings, notions, likes, dislikes, things we don't might not necessarily recognize immediately as being thoughts also. So how realistic is it to expect this can happen, that all phenomena can be annihilated? And I cite one example of somebody I know personally, actually all the regulars here on Sunday morning know the same person. And he said this publicly several times, even in an interview. So I don't think I'm uh, uh, saying anything out of character. This person, uh, Evan, who's here occasionally on Sunday mornings, he has gone through periods in his life where he has done, as you point to, given up all thoughts. He has practiced self-inquiry constantly throughout the day, all waking hours, and it gained him valuable experiences, which he's described in great detail for us, which sound very attractive, to pursue those for those experiences. It exhausted him. And, and he says now he thinks about returning to that from time to time because he knows there's a payoff to it, but that it, it exhausts, it, it would exhaust anybody. So how practical is this? <laughs> okay. Firstly, if we're doing something that is giving us experiences, we are not attending to ourselves because all experiences are just thoughts. That they all, any, the only real experience is what we are always experiencing, which is that fundamental awareness I am. Experiencing anything other than that fundamental awareness I am is experiencing something other than ourselves. So in, in the path of yoga, for example, the aim is to experience so uh, that is in yoga they are seeking experiences in bhagavan's path we are not seeking any experience we are seeking the experiencer whatever we may experience it is just a mental fabrication bhagavan says in verse 20 i think of uludunapadu even seeing god without seeing oneself is seeing only a manomaya mamkakshi, a mental fabrication, a, a, a sight made of, of, of formed of mind. So we are not seeking any experience. We are seeking the experiencer. When we know what we actually are, all experience will come to an end. Sometimes the, the state of true self-knowledge, of pure self-awareness, is sometimes it's referred to as apmanobhuti, the experience of oneself. But that is not an experience like any other experience. In all other experience, you've got an experiencer, you've got something that is experiencing it, and you've got a means of experiencing it. Whereas in the true experience, the experience of our own being, we can experience that only by being that. That is what we actually are, is pure awareness. Pure awareness can never be an object of experience. What is aware of pure awareness is only pure awareness itself. So in order to experience ourselves as pure awareness, we need to lose ourselves in that pure awareness. So long as we are experiencing anything other than ourselves, we are not surrendering ourselves. We are not letting go. I like that. I see it as a positive approach as opposed to what I would label a negative approach. I mean, I don't really mean that. It's yeah. also negative. The negative approach is to annihilate all the phenomena, all the thoughts. The positive approach, the positive approach is to, uh, to, to focus on awareness. Exactly. By focusing on ourselves, we don't have to worry about annihilating it. What does Bhagavan say? How do we annihilate it? By vicharana. What does vicharana mean? Vicharana means holding on to that self-attentiveness. So in, in other places in Nana, in the sixth paragraph, Bhagavan says, etene enengal erinomena. However many thoughts arise, so what? So we, we are not to be concerned about thoughts. We are to be concerned only with attending to ourselves. When thoughts appear, that is a sign that our attention has gone away from ourselves. So we don't try and get rid of the thoughts. We just return to self-attentiveness. Let the thoughts take care of themselves. No thought can rise without our attending to it. That's why Bhagavad said, what's it matter however many thoughts rise? 
as and when each thought arises, we should vigilantly investigate to whom has it arisen. When we investigate to whom has it arisen, the mind will thereby return to its birthplace, to its source, and the thought which has arisen will automatically subside because there's no one to attend to it. So we're not fighting with thoughts. We're not trying to destroy thoughts. We're not trying to destroy phenomena. We're trying to know what we actually are. When we know what we actually are, ego is thereby annihilated, and everything known by ego, in other words, all phenomena are annihilated along with it. But if we're trying to get rid of ph phenomena, like in yoga, they try to get rid of experience of anything of themselves by, by means of, uh, of pranayama and other practices, they try to withdraw their attention from all other things. The resulting state is what they call nivikalpa samadhi. But according to Bhagavan, that nivikalpa samadhi is just a state of manolaya. It's just a temporary dissolution of mind. And as soon as the mind comes out of manolaya, it again begins to wander under the sway of its vasanas. So that is not our aim. The yogis are trying to withdraw their attention from other things. We are not trying to withdraw our attention from other things. We are trying to attend to, to, to focus our attention on ourselves. By focusing our attention on ourselves, our attention is automatically withdrawn from other things. But merely withdrawing our attention from other things it is not a solution. Every day when we fall asleep, when we're too tired to continue thinking, we stop thinking. <laughs> we fall asleep. That is, so we fall asleep because we are too tired to continue projecting and attending and experiencing phenomena. So when we fall asleep, we are not attending to ourselves. We are just withdrawing our attention from everything else. And so we fall in sleep. Because we fall asleep without attending to ourselves, we are, it's only a temporary state. It's a state of manolaya, not a state of manonasa. That is any any state of dissolution of mind in which but we enter by any means other than self-attentiveness is a temporary state of dissolution. The mind will remain dissolved for a while and again it rises up. And when it rises up, all its vasanas arise with it. Because in state of manolaya, you, you don't get rid of any vasana. The vasanas remain. They're waiting just to, to pop up along with ego. So that's why Bhagavan used to tell that story of the yogi on the banks of uh, Ganga, who was so adept in, um, in the practices of yoga that he was able to go into Nivikalpa Samadhi for prolonged periods of time. One day when he woke up from Nivikalpa Samadhi, he asked his disciple to fetch him some water from the nearby Ganga. The disciple went to the Ganga to, uh, to get water. By the time he came back, the yogi had gone back into Samadhi. And that time he was so deeply absorbed in samadhi, he remained in that state for 300 years. So in, in the course of those 300 years, the Ganga changed course. It was then several miles away. Um, and because it had changed course, the village also moved. The disciple and were, all the other people, they passed away long ago. After 300 years, the yogi woke up. And the first thing he did was he angrily asked, where's my water? So Bhagavan said, even the most superficial thought, the last thought that was in his mind before he went into Nivikalpa Samadhi was the first thought that popped up. So if even the most superficial thought is not annihilated, what to say about all the vasanas, the seeds that give rise to all the thoughts? So according to Bhagavan, whether you stay in Nivikalpa Samadhi for three minutes or three hours or three years or 300 years or 3,000 years, it's... It is of no benefit spiritually. It's just like sleeping. When we sleep, we don't. We, it's very pleasant to sleep. We all like to sleep, but we don't gain any spiritual benefit by it because we enter sleep merely because of tiredness. The yogi enters Nivikalpa Samadhi because of the yogi practices by which he withdraws his attention from everything else. Our aim is not to withdraw our attention from other things. Our aim is to attend only to ourselves. If we attend only to ourselves, automatically our attention is withdrawn from other things. So Bhagavan's path, as you say, this is a positive path. We, that, that is, this isn't the path of neti neti. We're not trying to get rid of, I'm not this body, I'm not this mind. We are trying, what am I? Who am I? Hold on to what I am. I am only I. 
hold on to I and let everything else, and don't be concerned about other things. In verse 6 of Arunachala Ashtakam, in the last line, Bhagavan says, Nindrida sendrida ninevida vindre. Let them appear or let them not appear. They are not other than you. Uh, he's talking about the world appearance. So let all these phenomena appear or let them not appear. They're nothing other than you. What does he imply by that? I'm concerned only with attending to you. You there means Arunachala. Who is he, as he said in the first line of that verse, that light of awareness that is ever shining in the heart or ever shining as the heart. That is what we should be holding on to. We should be holding on to ourselves, holding on to that fundamental awareness I am and be unconcerned about other things. Let thoughts appear or not appear. If we notice that thoughts appear, that means our attention has gone away from ourselves. So let's bring it back to ourselves. So oh. thoughts are not the problem. Allowing our attention to move away from ourselves is the problem. So the solution is to hold our attention on ourselves. Hello, Michael. Yes. Hello. This clinging to I am, my understanding is as soon as we're making effort, that we're kind of losing it. Like there's really no effort involved. Isn't everything just happening by itself? Um, well, no, Bhagavan said effort is necessary because, because we have Vishaya Vasana, because as ego, it's our nature to cling to other things. So to, in order to cling to ourselves, it takes effort because we are, we are swimming against the current, so to speak. The, current, the flow of our Vasanas is always to take our attention outwards. So we are trying to flow again, swim against the current in order to go back within. So effort is necessary, but the effort is not a doing. It's an effort of just being. That is, attending to ourselves is not a doing, it is a being. So we need effort just to be as we actually are. Yeah, but why would we need effort? To be as we are, because we're already it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Very good question. <laughs> yes. Though we we always are as we are, we seem to have risen as ego. We seem to be aware of so many things other than ourselves. What we actually are is one. What we actually are is one only without a second. We are the only one. Nothing other than ourselves exists. So so long as we are aware of multiplicity, we are not aware of ourselves as we actually are. Because what is it we're seeing as all this multiplicity? Since we alone exist, it's only ourself that we see as all this. So when we see ourselves as all this multiplicity, we are not seeing ourselves as we actually are. So it is so long as we rise as ego, effort is necessary to be as we actually are. When when by clinging so firmly to ourselves but we thereby subside and dissolve forever back into our source, then we will find no effort is necessary at all because this is our real nature. But so long as we seem to have risen as, effort, as ego, effort seems to be necessary. So it seems like I can relate to a stage in the middle where I'm not totally identified with the mind or I'm not totally abiding in true nature, but it kind of vacillates where I notice, I notice true nature. I recognize I awareness. Let's put it that way. I notice I am, but I, my attention isn't always there. Right. But it doesn't seem like effort really does anything for me anymore. It's just I naturally, organically start. I notice. And then I go, you know, I, I go the other way and then I notice, I keep noticing and going yes. back to it naturally. Yes, yes. That, that is, as the love increases, they, supposing you're given some work to do, if you enjoy that work, it won't seem like work to you. But if, mm. you're, if, you, don't, if you don't have love for what you're doing, it will seem like an effort is required. So when we truly have love, to know and to be what we actually are, this effort will seem to be no effort at all. Yeah. But because, so long as we have even the slightest, 
inclination to attend to ourselves, even the slightest liking to be aware of anything other than ourselves, effort is necessary. So well said. Yeah. And you, you say you say between the identification and being what we actually are, there is actually no nothing in between. Either we are aware of ourselves as we actually are, or if we're aware of anything else, we have already identified ourselves. Because it's only when we identify ourselves as I am Ronald or I am Michael, but all the that other things appear in sleep. You're not aware of your, you're aware of yourself just as I am. You're not aware of yourself as I am Ronald. Therefore, you're not aware of anything else. But in waking and dream, you're aware of yourself as I am Ronald. Consequently, you're aware of other things. As Bhagavan says in the verse four of Religion Apatu, if oneself is a form, the world and God will be likewise. If oneself is not a form, who can see their forms and how? So we see this multiplicity of forms only when we identify ourselves with as one among them. Now we identify ourselves. I am this person. I am this form consisting mm -hmm. of five sheaths, as Bhagavan says. Mm -hmm. So this form of five sheaths, so long as we are aware of anything else, we're aware of other things because we have identified ourselves with this form of five sheaths. How to give up this identification? Only by holding on to I am. Because the, whatever we identify ourselves with, they are adjuncts, things that have been added to us. They are added to us because we're holding on to them. If we want to let, that, that is in order to free ourselves from them, we need to hold on to what alone is real, namely I am. To the extent to which we hold on to I am, to that extent, Ronald and Michael and everything else will drop off. I like what you said about um, loving. That is absolutely essential. That is the key. It, it, yeah, that's, that hit the nail right on the head. Yeah. Is I like it and it attracts me because I like it. Yeah. So I don't need effort. It, yes, well, yeah, but because of your liking for it, the, your, the effort it, is coming naturally to you. Yeah, yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. Right, right. <laughs> that is Bhagavan's path. People think, oh, Ramana Maharshi just taught this dry path of jnana. This is actually, this is the pinnacle of the Bhakti Marga. This is, that is... The, the pinnacle of bhakti is surrender. And surrender can be complete only when we investigate ourselves. Because how can we surrender ourselves without investigating what we are? Because the nature of ego, so long as we're attending to anything else, ego is, is flourishing, rising and flourishing and doing very well. But ego feeds on other things. When we attend to ourselves, that alone is surrendering ourselves. So this is the pinnacle of the path of bhakti. So we need great, we need all-consuming love to succeed in this path. Most of us feel now, oh, I don't have sufficient love. That is true. How do we get sufficient love? By persevering in this practice. That is the more we, we practice being self-attentive, the more the love to be self-attentive grows. That's why Bhagavan said, bhakti is the mother of jnana. So the path that Bhagavan has taught us is the purest path of bhakti. Bhakti in its purest form is just clinging to self-attentiveness. Because what is real? What is God? What is Brahman? It's nothing but I am. So we can forget about God, forget about uh, Brahman. All we are concerned about is, who am I? Hold on to this I. Excuse me, we have a question from Maria. Yes, <clears throat> this viragya, it's not like a sort of dullness that sometimes you, you feel like, you know, when you don't want anything, a sort of like almost depression. Yeah, it's yeah. not yeah. the same, right? <laughs> There's a, there's a term that is sometimes used. Uh, I don't know if they use it in other Indian languages, but in Tamil they say, smasana vairagya. Smasana means the cremation ground. So you may have lots of worldly desires, 
But when a friend close of yours, close to you, dies, and you go to a crem cremation ground and see him being burned. You, you say, oh, I have no interest in this life. What is this life and everything? You, you, for a short while, you had Veragya. After one or two days, you get, go back to all your worldly endeavors. So th that is not the true Veragya. The true Veragya is born of a deep love to know what we actually are. We, we have desire for other things because we... That, that is, we, we have a, so much taste to experience other things, so much liking to experience other things, so much interest in experiencing other things. So the, 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 the veragi is that state in which we are, no, we are not interested in anything other than ourselves. As Bhagavan says, not attending to anything other than ourselves is veragya. Not leaving ourselves is jnana. The two are one and the same. So true veragya is only the love to attend to ourself. That love to attend to ourself has to be greater than the interest we have or the inclination we have to attend to anything else. Does that adequately answer your question? Yes, yes. It's, it's like... Um... Once I heard you say that that suffering in itself cannot lead to liberation, like no. it, it feels it's the same thing. Like yeah, yeah. Uh, suffering may motivate us to begin to seek liberation, but suffering itself cannot be a means. Because what is suffering? Suffering is something other than us. What we actually are is happiness. So the path to know what we actually are has to be a happy path. We, we can't know what we actually are by suffering because suffering is something alien to us. Suffering, do we experience, do, have you ever experienced any suffering in sleep? No. So sleep, suffering is alien to us. But what, when, when everything else drops off and we alone remain, as in sleep, we are perfectly happy. So happiness is our real nature. So, you know, the, the nature of the, goal of, of the path cannot be other than the nature of the goal. Since, it, since the goal is to experience supreme happiness, this path has to be a happy path. How is it a happy path? The more we surrender, the more we let go of other things, the more we are free from concern about anything else, the more happy and contented and peaceful we are. In in the 13th paragraph of Nana, which I'll be talking about um, later, uh, some other day, um, Bhagavan uses the analogy of a passenger traveling in a train. That is, when you're traveling on a train, whether you carry your little luggage on your head or put it aside, the train is carrying it all. So by, ca by carrying your luggage on your head, you're suffering unnecessarily. Whereas if you put it aside, you can travel very comfortably knowing the train is carrying everything. He uses the word there. Kashtapad, ain't kashtapad of endum. Why to, why to suffer carrying it on your head when you can put it aside and travel very sukhamai, he says, very happily. So Bhagavan's path, the, Bhagavan's path is the path of surrender. And surrender is the, the most pleasant path because the more we let go of other things, the, the, the less we are troubled by other things. There's a verse in Tirukkara. Tirukkara is a very, um, a very famous classical work in Tamil. It's a very popular work. It consists just of two line aphorisms. Um, there's one verse there that Bhagavan often used to refer to. Yadlin, yadilin, ningin ad odal, ad nodal, adlin, adlin, ilan. From whatever, from whatever, you. Uh, you free yourself, or you you ninginal, uh, you withdraw yourself, you, you let go of, you're free from the suffering of that thing. So the more we surrender, the more we the less we will suffer. We suffer only because we're not surrendering. So the, the sign of true surrender is being happy and contented and unperturbed by anything. Not being happy just because, oh, now my life is very pleasant, I'm happy. We need to be happy whether our life is pleasant or unpleasant, whether good things happen or bad things happen. We need to be in a state of 
equanimity, that state of equanimity, that is the true samadhi, that is the sahaja samadhi, being unperturbed by whatever may happen. Does that adequately answer your question? Yes, thank you. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> so, sh shall, oh, oh uh, Sarah, you've got your hand raised. Do you want to ask something? Kia uh, ora, Michael. I yes. have got a fundamental <laughs> question on the fundamental uh, uh, Bhagavan teaching. The difference between the happiness and the uh, Anandam, Satchit Anandam. Because recently I was come across this Ribu Gita. Mm. Every uh, paragraph ending up, be happy, be happy. Yes. <laughs> so this be happy, how can that be Bhagavan teaching in paragraph 9 of Nanja? These are duality, happy and sad, uh, good and bad, do, and all the phenomena in the world is by these diets and triads yes those are not real yes so when we think of happy we will think okay we have a good meal or we can we are going on a holiday or even we can go to space shuttle or whatever depends on our prarapta <laughs> we we think okay if we come to bhagavan path we have to be eternally happy but my understanding, I don't know, you have to correct it, <laughs> that happiness is not actually what we are looking for. Even in Bhagavan teaching, there is a, I don't know where I heard this, when you are doing a self-investigation with the love you are looking for yourself, you have to, even not thinking about getting that Satchit Anandam, you have you if you are expecting that that is also you are <laughs> and other thing once you get into that stage who is going to experience that satchit anandam <laughs> because there is no i no ego so we don't know exactly what is the real state because there are no there may be no words all these happy and sad whatever we are thinking of this Bhagavan path, uh, we may be poorly understood or misunderstood about this happiness by thinking we will be happy. So actually the Ribu Hida is the one <laughs> making me to think what uh, it is diluting us. So we are falsely believing, okay, we will be happy. That is our most of our understanding. We want to be happy. Even in this aspect, I like to ask all the sentient beings like to be happy. So is Jnani is the sentient beings? I'm really doubting last night. What is say, so sentient beings have got likes and dislikes, but Jnani, Jnani doesn't have a like and dislike, but he is sentient or is a being. <laughs> you need to answer to that. I can't the understand. What sentient is. being, in the English translation, sentient being is a translation of jiva. The jnani is not a jiva. The jiva means the ego, the, the limited. Uh, that is only when we identify ourselves as a body are we a jiva. The jnani, as Bhagavan said, jnana me jnani. Jnana alone is the jnani. So the jnana, jnani is not a person. In our view, Bhagavan seems to be a person. He seems to be, he seems to have a body and to have a mind and to be answering our questions and whatever. But Bhagavan said, I am not this. I am that. I am only I. I am that which is shiny in the heart of everyone as I. So the jnani is nothing other than I. So, so long as we are aware of anything other than ourselves. That is Agnana, 
Bhagavan says in um in verse 13 of Uludunapadu, Jnana Mam Tane Me, one self who is jnana, whose pure awareness alone is real, Nana Vam Jnana Vajnana Mam, awareness of multiplicity, of otherness, of any diversity is ignorance. So the jnani is free of ignorance. The jnani is free of awareness of anything other than itself. So, the, so only the jnana, jnana means pure awareness. Who can experience, who can be aware of pure awareness? Only pure awareness can know pure awareness. So the jnani is nothing other than pure awareness. Regarding what you asked about happiness and satchitananda, Satchit and Ananda are not three different things, Sat and Chit and Ananda. Sat is Chit and Ananda. Chit is Sat and Ananda. Ananda is Sat and Chit. Since Ananda is Chit, who is to experience that Ananda? Only Ananda can experience Ananda. So the true happiness that we actually are is beyond the dyads, beyond the pairs of opposites, the happiness and unhappiness. But the existence that we actually are is beyond the existence and non-existence. The awareness that we actually are is beyond awareness and non-awareness. So um, we, we are seeking that real happiness, but for which there is no opposite. That is, and we can we can experience, as Bhagavan said, that happiness is our real nature. So we can experience that happiness only by knowing and being what we actually are. We can experience happiness only by being happiness. That is the true happiness. But the path we are on, and I, I, I was talking about happiness in terms of the path we're on. If we are following Bhagavan's path correctly, we are surrendering, we are letting go of other things. And to the extent we let go of other things, we are free from the suffering of caused by those things. So we are happy. If you're carrying your luggage on your head, how uncomfortable it is. If you put it aside, how pleasant it is. So is, surrender is the most pleasant path there is. Who is? To be happy after we annihilate the happy uh, ego, there's no one to experience the happiness. The obstacle to happiness is our rising as ego. Why do we seem to experience anything other than infinite happiness? Is because we've risen as ego. When ego remains, who experiences happiness is happiness itself, because we are happiness. We ourselves are. Are there experiencing ourselves as we actually are, which is as infinite happiness? Yes, it's a, that is the reason I am thinking as we are Bhagavan devotees, we are thinking. So long happiness. as happiness is something that comes and goes, it's something other than you. But happiness, true happiness, is not something that comes and goes, it is our very nature. So, we, who experiences happiness in sleep? Because we are free of everything else, we experience ourselves as we actually are, and what we actually are is happiness. Yeah, these are um, uh, intellectually we understood from Bhagavan teaching. Yes. But there is no exact word, this happiness, you know, in Tamil, there is all these happiness, but we are looking in the world called Sittinbam. Mm. But with the Satchitananda, we call Perinbam. Yes. So there is a different uh, near terminology. Even that, I don't think, is a fraction of what the happiness. What we, we don't know actually. There is not no one to all, realize all, that happiness. All Chitrimbam, all this petty happiness that we experience in this life. It's a, it's a, it's an iota of infinite happiness of the Perinbam, but we actually are. So Bhagavan says when. When, whenever a, an, a desired object is achieved, the mind is the mind uh, is subdued because it's no longer agitated by that desire. So it experiences, uh, it returns to the heart and experiences an iota of that infinite happiness that it actually is. So, perimbum and chitrimbum are not two different happinesses. Perimbum is the real happiness. The, the, when we experience an iota of that, we call it chitrimbam. But it's the same happiness. We need to just drop the, the, the smallness 
and the, the infinite happiness alone will remain. The smallness is our rising as ego. If we are finite, we can only experience finite happiness. And so long as there's finite happiness, there's also finite unhappiness. When we drop our finite nature by knowing ourselves as we actually are, we, we remain as infinite, and our, but we then experience ourselves as infinite happiness. Because that happiness is the very nature of infinitude. What I am thinking, we are confused or uh, having a delusion. If we come into the uh, by Bhagavan path, we are having a shortcut to get the happiness. But I don't think this happiness, we even should not think about this happiness, achieving the happiness. Then Whatever why it did, comes. Why did Bhagavan start uh, Nana by talking? The first paragraph of Nana wasn't in the original questions that uh, the answers that Your Bhagavan gave to Sri Pakash and Palai. Bhagavan wrote that first paragraph separately when he wrote the essay. So he added that because it's such an important topic, because we are all seeking happiness. We all love to be happy because happiness is our real nature. But when we when we annihilate the ego, there's no one to experience that happiness. That there's, also Bhagavan said to us. There's nobody to experience happiness as an object. But you yourself are happiness. Why do you worry about ego? Why do you want ego there? The ego is the problem. <laughs> Leave ego and be as you are. When you that that is all these questions arise when we are when we are sitting on the edge of the of the of the ocean of nectar and we're having our, we're having discussions about the ocean of nectar. Bhagavan says, don't talk about the ocean of nectar, dive in it, drown yourself in it. So the more we go into the deeper we go in this practice, the clearer all these things will become. Because happiness is our real nature. So to the extent to which we attend to ourselves, it will be clear to us that happiness is not something that comes from outside. Happiness is our own real nature. So since happiness is our own real nature, we don't need an ego to experience it. Ego is what gets in the way. Drop ego, and then you remain as Satchitananda. And Satchitananda alone experiences Satchitananda. Yeah, only Bhagavan teaching what I need to get it. What we so need to do, one. what we need to do, the real clarity can come only from practice. We can go yes. on and on talking about it. We can go on and on questioning about it. But if we don't put it into practice, it will not become clear. Whatever I say, whatever Bhagavan says will not be clear until we actually put what he's saying into practice. Practice is essential. If we put it into practice, these questions will no longer arise. Yes, that is an important thing. We have to we have to have a love to find out who are we or who am I. That is the only thing Bhagavan's basic fundamental exactly. teaching. Exactly. But we there are a few things he said we are happy, then we are misunderstood that happy, and then we are looking for the world he sit in bomb. Then no, that expecting. is not Bhagavan says happiness lies in letting go, not in grasping things. So long as you're grasping anything other than yourself, that's a miserable state. But holding on to ourself, that alone is happiness, is, is true happiness. Yeah, definitely. So, so yes, let us follow sometime, the path that Bhagavan has shown us, and all these things become clear. Because Bhagavan said is the sleep is a state of pure being. Then sometimes people may think if I if my sleep get disturbed. I am out of Satchitananda. So that is all a misinterpretation. <laughs> you are never, of you teaching. yourself are Satchitananda. How can you ever be out of yourself? So we, that is, we can go on and on discussing these things, but why to, that, that is, discussing Bhagavan's teachings is useful to the extent but it encourages us to put it into practice. Otherwise, if we just go on and on asking questions and thinking about these things, 
we are missing the point. The whole point of Bhagavan's teachings is you yourself are that. Know yourself and you will know that. So we, th that is sometimes when we are, some questions are useful. A lot of questions are useless. We are analyzing, but that, as Bhagavan says, we're, you, you're analyzing the, the rubbish in the barber shop. Yes. Stop analyzing rubbish in the barber shop. Why Bowen gave that analogy? We shouldn't be concerned about anything other than ourselves. What we are to investigate is only ourselves. So let us let us leave aside all this um, expectation. Yeah, we, we we cannot find the truth in words. The words are useful to the extent to which they point our attention back at ourselves. If we don't turn our attention back to ourselves, if we go on seeking the truth in words, then we'll, see, we'll be thinking about chitrimbum and perimbum and all the differences and whether this is a dyad or why to think all these things. We need to understand that the true understanding of Bhagavan's teachings can come only to the extent we put it into practice. When we put it into practice, these, these trivial questions will all dissolve because they're not important. What is important is that we attend to ourselves. That is, what is Bhagavan talking about in this 10th and 11th paragraph? He's emphasizing so much the need for us to uh, attend to ourselves. That is all that is required. In fact, the very next sentence, if I can carry on, the, the next <laughs> sentence is such an important sentence. In the next sentence, Bhagavan says, after giving that analogy of the pearl diver, he then says, Oruvan tan sarupam adeyam varayil nirantara sarupa smaranaye kai patruvanayin adu ondre podam. That means, if one clings fast to uninterrupted sarupa smarana until one at attains a uh, sarupa, that alone is sufficient. Swarup, swarupa means our own real nature, what we actually are. In other words, that fundamental awareness I am. Swarupa smarana, smarana means remembrance. So swarupa smarana is another way of saying swarupa dhyana, self-attentiveness. So if we hold on to self-attentiveness, whatever, it doesn't matter whatever else we may be doing, we are always aware I am. So let us try to hold on to, let us not forget that awareness I am. That is what Bhagavan means by holding on, clinging fast to uninterrupted Swarupa Smarana. If we do that, that alone is sufficient. So all Bhagavan has asked us to do is to hold on to self-attentiveness, hold on to self-remembrance. Don't forget yourself. Continue trying to hold on to I am. If you do so, when we are turning our attention within, when we are attending to ourselves, we are attending to the, to the original source, to the source of all light. So we are, so to speak, bathing in the light, in the light of the clarity of pure awareness. So the more we bathe in that clarity of pure awareness, the more the mind is purified and everything will become clear to us. So when unnecessary questions arise, to whom are all these questions? That's why so many questions, if you read books like talks, so many questions that people ask Bhagavan, Bhagavan turns their attention back to themselves. Why are you concerned with all these things? Who are you? Who is asking these questions? Know that. Know yourself first. Then you can know about all these other things. So we need to be so, in, to follow Bhagavan's path, we need to be extremely focused, extremely one-pointed, extremely single-minded. Nothing else should interest us. The only thing that should interest us is who am I? We should be passionately interested in knowing ourselves and in being ourselves. Because we can know ourselves only by being ourselves, and we can be ourselves only by holding fast to our own being, to I am. Thank so, you very much. Yes. So this sentence, this uh, uh, in which Bhagavan said, this alone is sufficient. This is a very great assurance to us. Bhagavan has given us such a simple path. All we need to do is to attend to ourselves. If we hold on to that self-attentiveness, if we hold on to that uh, uninterrupted Swarupa Smarana, as he says here, this uninterrupted self-remembrance, that alone is sufficient. Nothing else is necessary.
So in the previous sentence, he spoke about uh, diving deep within with the stone of Veragia. In this sentence, he's not talking about diving deep within. At least, even if you can't hold, dive deep within, at least hold on to self-attentiveness. Cling to it for dear life. Um, uh, like if you're, if you're, uh, if you're um, swept away in a flood, if you manage to catch a raft, how firmly you'll hold on to that raft. This, the raft Bhagavan has given us is this simple practice of self-attentiveness. We should cling to it so firmly. Even if we feel, oh, I'm not able to go very deep within, doesn't matter. Just hold on to that self-remembrance. The more we hold on to the self-remembrance, the more the vishaya of asanas will be weakened, and the more we will automatically sink deep within ourselves. So we don't have to make a special effort to go, I want to go deep within myself. Just hold on to self-attentiveness. But the deepening of that self-attentiveness will happen automatically. The more we cling to it, the deeper it will become. The deeper and clearer and purer and it will become. So that's all Bhagavan has asked us to do, to cling firmly to self-attentiveness. And then he ends this paragraph. In the last two sentences, he gives just an analogy without explaining what the analogy, what it is analogous to, but we should be able to understand from the context. What he says in the, in the last two uh, sentences is, Kote kul edire gal ulla vareil adilirindu velie vandu konde irpagal. So long as enemies are within the fortress, they will be continuously coming out from it. Vara vara avegale elam deti konde irandal kote kaivasa padom. If one is continuously cutting down or destroying all of them as and when they come, the fortress will be captured. So why Bhagavan has gone here to suddenly talk about uh, warfare, about uh, besieging a fortress? This is an analogy he's giving here. So what, what did this analogy mean? The fortress is our own heart. The enemies in the fortress are ego and its army of Vishayavasanas who have occupied our heart. So we are now besieging our heart in order to regain possession of it, to reclaim our heart from ego and its vasanas. So when you're, when you, if you're besieging a fortress, if the enemy within the fortress have lots of food and water, they won't be too worried. They'll, they've got a, a nice supply, so they'll stay inside. But if they have no food and water, they will have to, be keep, they have to keep coming out in order to forage for food and water, because otherwise they'll starve. The, the enemies in the, in the fortress of our heart, the enemies are ego and vishaya vasanas. They have no food there in the fortress. That is, ego depends for its nourishment upon things other than itself. Only by attending to other things can ego... Uh, as Bhagavan says in uh, verse 25 of Uludhanaptu, grasping form, it comes into existence. Grasping form, it stands. Grasping and feeding on form, it flourishes. So what that means is ego, ego is nourished and sustained only by attending to things other than itself. And its vasanas are its inclination to attend to other things. So, so long as they're in the fortress, so long as they're there in our heart, they'll keep on trying to come out. So ego will come out under the sway of its vasanas in order to try and forage for food. So if we, if we cut them down, as and when they come, eventually we'll be able to capture the fortress. So what does he mean by cutting them down as and when they come? That means as and when our attention moves away from ourselves under the sway of vasanas, we need to turn our attention back and hold on to self-attentiveness. If we're holding on to self-attentiveness, we are thereby cutting down the vasanas as and when they come. And by cutting them down, then the, the, more, the, the more we cling to self-attentiveness, the weaker the vasanas become. The weaker the vasanas become, the weaker ego becomes. Because ego is like the commander-in-chief of an army. But, the commander-in-chief is powerless on his own. He, he 
he appears strong because of the strength of his army. To the, the more his army is weakened, the weaker he becomes. Uh, likewise, the, 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 more, the weaker the Vishay of Asanas become, the weaker ego becomes. Because ego, ego do, uh, of course, they, they, the Vasanas have no strength of their own. It's ego who gives them strength. That is, the Vasanas are just, uh, they, they, they are the ego's inclination. So, so long as we're interested in other things, we are giving strength to the Vasanas. When we withdraw our interest from other things and uh, take interest only in attending to ourselves and trying to know and to be what we actually are, we are depriving uh, ego of, we, we, we are weakening the Vasanas and thereby weakening ego. So the more we, we persevere in this practice, of, uh, of clinging to self-attentiveness, the weaker the vasanas will become and the, the more willing we will become to surrender ourselves completely. So if, if the enemies come out of the fortress, that means that we haven't been vigilant in, our, in besieging the fortress. So if we are vigilant, if we are guarding every exit from the fortress, the enemy cannot come out without facing us and being cut down by us. So we need to be so vigilantly self-attentive, but we don't allow our attention to come out to feed on anything other than ourselves. That is what Bhagavan implies here. So as and when our attention pops out to, to wander here or there, we need to cut it down by clinging to self-attentiveness. So this is a... Uh, this is a a very beautiful analogy Bhagavan gets here. And these two paragraphs, these are this is the very heart of this work, Nana, because this is this is the real here Bhagavan is discussing the real nitty-gritty of the practice. What is the problem we all face in practice is our liking to attend to other things. That liking to attend to anything other than ourselves, that is what Bhagavan refers to as the share of asanas. That is the enemies within the fortress. So we need to, so whenever we, whenever there any liking to attend to anything else arises, we need to cut it down then and there by holding on to self-attentiveness, by clinging tenaciously to Swarupa Dhyana, by holding fast to Swarupa Smarana. How, I mean, these are just different ways of saying the same thing. We need to be so keenly self-attentive, but we don't allow our attention to move away towards anything else. So are there any questions anyone would like to ask about this? I have one, Michael. Yes. The, it's in two parts, but I think they're both the same thing. It's like one is in the clinging to the attention. You make it sound pretty easy, although I don't find that personally so. What I do find rather easy is, I think what you're talking about here in paragraph 11, is letting go of everything, any yeah. thoughts, any visions, any experience, it, let, letting go is a simple process. And then I'm left with the result of that, which is what I think is self-attention. Right. When I try to hold on to that, then I feel like I'm making effort to hold on to something. But at that point, if I let go of this desire to hold on, then I go back to that place. So my question is, is this a correct understanding of what you're trying to express there? We have to be very careful here because merely letting go of other things is not the path Bhagavan has taught us. That is, every day when we fall asleep, we let go of everything. But just letting go of other things will result in layer, in mana layer, in just a temporary dissolution of mind if we do not cling to self-attentiveness. That, that is, our focus should be on ourselves, on this fundamental awareness I am. This is why Bhagavan is constantly emphasizing the need for self-attentiveness. As he says, letting go of other things, is, that is Vairagya. But what's most important is not letting go of ourselves, holding on to ourselves. That is Jnana. And 
if we are holding on to ourselves, we are thereby automatically letting go of other things. But if we just take letting go of other things to be our aim, then we will end up in Manalaya. So holding on to that, when you let go of other things, what remains? What remains is your own being, your that awareness I am. Hold on to that. Don't, don't, don't allow your attention to slip away from that. Because if you allow your attention to slip away from that, you're liable to end up in, in, in uh, Manala and sleep or some similar state. So this So when 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 uh, you're talking about Varagya attached to your belt to help you dive deeper. Yes. This is dispassion. This is letting go, correct? Yes. And then so this takes you to that place of self. And that at that point, it's more just an awareness of what you're experiencing at that time yes, rather but, than effort to do anything. But, but Bhagavan is talking about it's sinking deep within. We sink deep within by holding on to ourselves. In order to hold on to mm. ourselves, we need Vairagya because so, so long as we don't have Vairagya, we'll have too much liking to hold on to other things. So it's necessary to have Vairagya in order to let go of other things. But merely letting go of other things is not sufficient. Our aim is to hold on to ourselves. We, to the extent to which we hold on to ourselves, we are automatically letting go of other things. So if we're not willing to let go of other things, if we don't have Vairagya, we mm. won't be able to hold on to ourselves. But the, the key is holding on to ourselves. That's why Bhagavan said, in the previous paragraph, he was talking about, he, well, it's the same thing, it's just different terms he used. He talked about Swarupa Dhyana, that means self-attentiveness, attending only to ourself. In this mm -hmm. paragraph, he talks about uh, Vicharana. Vicharana means, uh, it, uh, it implies Atma Vichara, self-investigation. So again, it means the same thing, it's holding on to ourself. In, in a later paragraph, in the 16th paragraph, He's, he defines what he means by Atma Vichara, uh, keeping the mind always fixed in what, on oneself or in oneself is, is Atma Vichara, is what he says. What does he mean by keeping the mind always fixed on oneself? That means whole, whole, be, being self-attentive. That is, if you keep your mind fixed on something, that means you're attending to it. If you're, if you, if you're reading a very interesting book or you're watching a very interesting film, your attention is riveted on that. You're, 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 you're fixing your mind on that. That means you're not allowing your attention to go anywhere else. So we need to fix our attention on ourselves. That, that is absolutely essential. Otherwise, we, many people say, oh, I've tried to meditate. I was able to be without thoughts. That is not be, our aim is not just to be without thoughts. In sleep, every night we're without thoughts for several hours every night. But we don't get any spiritual benefit from that. Our aim isn't to be without thoughts. Our aim is to know what we actually are. And we can know what we actually are only by attending to ourselves. How thoughts are relevant here, if we are aware of any thoughts, that shows our attention has moved away from ourselves towards those thoughts. So Bhagavan says, don't fight with the thoughts. Let the thoughts come or go. It doesn't matter how many thoughts come. As and when any thought appears, to whom does it appear? We turn our attention back to ourselves. So Bhagavan's path is not a negative path of rejecting things or letting things go. His path is a positive path of holding on to what is real. If you hold on to what is real, what is unreal will automatically slip off. If you, if you merely let go of what is unreal, you end up in Manolaya, in sleep, or in uh, Nevikalpa Samadhi, or whatever people say, uh, whatever you choose to call it. It doesn't matter the name you call it. it mm -hmm. So so long as you, you haven't dissolved in that permanently, you will rise from it again. That, is, that state is useless. We want to bring about the destruction of ego. We can destroy ego only by clinging to self-attentiveness. There's no other way. Because what is ego? Ego is just a false awareness of ourself. An awareness of ourself is something other than what we actually are. Mm 
So we who are now aware of ourselves as I am this body, we need to be aware of ourselves as we actually are. So in order to be aware of ourselves as we actually are, we need to attend to ourselves. Is there any difference between attending to self and being? True being, that is, our, our being is its self-awareness. That is, we, being and awareness are not different. So when we are aware of nothing other than ourself, that is the state of being, or of just being. I mean, we all, we're always in the state of being, we, we, we always exist. But being in the state of what Bhagavan calls sumayraputu, just being, it means uh, being without rising as ego. In order to be without rising as ego, we need to hold on to self-attentiveness. To the extent to which we attend to ourselves, to that extent does ego dissolve back into its, its, its real being. This is why in Upadesha India, in verse 8, Bhagavan says, he uses two terms, anyabhavam and ananyabhavam. Anyabhavam means, in that context, means meditation on what is other than ourself. Anya means other. So in that context, he's referring to meditating on God. So if you take God to be something other than yourself, in other words, if you take God to be a name and form or an idea that you have of God, mm -hmm. You're mm -hmm. meditating on something other than yourself. Bhagavan says, rather than that, meditating on God as something other than yourself, meditating on him as not other than yourself, with the understanding that he is I. In other words, what he implies by meditating on what is not other means meditating only on ourselves. That is an etinamutam. That's the best of all. And then in the next verse, he says, verse 9, he says, by the strength of that meditation, that means by the strength of that self-attentiveness that he referred to in the previous verse, uh, being in one's real be in the state of being, which transcends bhavana, transcends all thinking, all, all, all um, meditation that involves attending to anything other than ourself, being in that, in that, uh, in that state of, of being, which transcends all this in the sat bhava, that is parabhakti, that is the supreme bhakti. So our aim is, well, to the extent to which we attend to ourselves, by the strength of that self-attentiveness, we are there by being as we actually are, is the implication. So in order to be as we actually are, we need to hold fast to self-attentiveness. Otherwise, we are liable to slip into manolaya. And that's, I mean, no harm in being a Manole. If you're in Manole for a thousand years, very pleasant, but <laughs> it's, not a, it's not a solution. It's because you come back again, you come back with all your baggage. I mean, it's very nice. We all like to sleep every night, but sleep doesn't solve all our problems because next morning when we wake up, we're back with all, our, all the same problems come back again. So, our e Manole is not a worthy aim. Our aim is. Manonasa, destruction of a mind, and the mind can be destroyed only by our knowing ourselves as we actually are. And to know ourselves as we actually are, we need to attend to ourselves. We need to be keenly self attentive. Well, it sounds like more practice is in order. It is in order. It is in order. But, but, but the nice thing about this part the more we practice it, the clearer it all becomes. People say, does it become easier? In a sense, yes, but in a sense, no, because the, the more you try and practice, the more clearly you are aware of how, the, how strong the vasanas are and how, how, how our attention, even when we think we're being self-attentive, still we are holding on to something other than ourselves. So we just need to be try to be attentive to ourselves more and more and more. As Bhagavan says, you cling firmly to Swarupa Smarana, to that mere remembrance of your fundamental awareness of being, I am, if you cling to that, that alone is sufficient. So that's all we have to do. We don't have to worry about thoughts. We don't have to worry about anything else. All we need to do is to try to attend to ourselves ever more keenly. 
and everything else will 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 be taken care of. Everything else will come automatically. So it's actually it's a it may seem difficult, but it's actually very simple what Bhagavan has asked us to do. And even though it seems difficult, even though our attention keeps on slipping away from other things, we can always we're always free to bring it back to ourselves. Even if we're able to hold on to that self-attentiveness for a few moments at a time, it doesn't matter. Every moment of self-attentiveness, we are making progress. So we just have to persevere in this path, trying more and more to be self-attentive. Michael, I always try to think I'm supposed to stay within the parameters, the boundaries of self-inquiry. And I've been reminded several times here and other places that sometimes I step outside of the boundary and I don't want to do that. Yeah. So one of the key phrases you use today is that awareness is the only state in which we don't leave ourselves. I think of that as being a practice of self-inquiry all by itself. Am I right or wrong? Well, we need to be very careful of this word awareness because awareness can mean awareness of things other than ourselves or awareness of our own being. That's you, a given, yes. It's the awareness of our own being that we need to hold on to. Actually, though, for me, reminding myself of the awareness of the outside world seems to be a linchpin to getting to awareness only of self. So I use it for well, a starter. Yes. <laughs> who, who is it who is aware of the outside world? Yes, yes, yes. That is what we... So we need to turn our attention... That is, if a world appears... Thank you, world, for appearing. You've reminded me I need to turn my attention back to myself. So is that a practice of self-inquiry? That's my question. Attending to ourself is the practice of self-inquiry. So any means you find of turning your attention away from other things back towards yourself, that is self-inquiry. Thank you. Attending to anything other than ourself is Anatma vichara, investigating things other than ourselves. Attending to ourself alone is atma vichara. Well, we only have a few minutes left here, but what I'd like to do is offer an invitation to our friends from Boston to uh, ask a question if if you have one. In the practice of uh, turning inwards and attending to myself, uh, uh, there's an element of um, love and faith. And I feel like there is, I have a great ally that dwells within myself, which is Bhagavan himself. Uh, So somehow there is a, within myself, uh, God or Bhagavan is, actually adding uh, to the practice. Um, it's not just my effort, uh, uh, but, but by turning it uh, in, inward, I feel like there, I'm turning towards some very powerful energy that is within myself. Absolutely. Bhag- the real form of Bhagavan, that is the outward form of Bhagavan, is just a form he assumed in order to turn our attention back within. But his teaching is that he is that which is ever dwelling in our heart as I. So the real Guru Bhakti, the real, or the real Deva Bhakti, the real love for God or love for Guru is only attending to ourself. And when we are attending to ourselves, we have a very powerful ally on our side. In fact, Bhagavan often used to say, Grace is the beginning, the middle, and the end. The very fact that we have any interest in this subject at all is entirely due to his grace. So it's grace that has drawn us to this path. It is grace that uh, gives us the love to try to put this into practice. And it is grace that gives us the, the, the the strength to persevere. And eventually, it is grace that is going to swallow us. That is why Bhagavan said, grace is the beginning, the middle, and the end. And what is grace? Grace is nothing but the infinite love that Bhagavan has for each and every one of us as himself. Because Bhagavan doesn't see us as anything other than ourselves. So he loves us as himself. So grace is his very nature. 
people say, oh, I must have, because of some uh, punya, some good actions I did in past lifetime, so I've come to Bhagavan. That is all humbug. We have come to Bhagavan that he, there is no cause for his grace. His grace is, as, as Sadhuam often used to say, karanamilada karane. It is co- it's uncaused grace because it's his very nature, his very swabhava is to is love. He he is he is as he said, Amburu Arunachala. The Arunachala is the very form of love. Arunachala and Bhagavan are one and the same. So Bhagavan is the very form of love. So it he it love is his very nature. So we don't earn his love. It's, it's not because of any good actions we've done, but we've come to his path. It's out of his pure grace. It, if at all we've done any good actions, even that is only by his grace. So everything is by his grace. So the, the more we turn within, the more we, we come to recognize his grace. We come to recognize the great love that he has for us. And the more we consequently get love to turn within. But that love, that love is only his love. Whatever love we have is love. The, the, the <coughs> love that we, is in, we find in our heart is itself Bhagavan. Thank you. So we are never alone on this path. We are always with Bhagavan. But again, we are always alone because Bhagavan is nothing but ourself. He is what we actually are. But so long as we, we, we feel ourselves to be something separate, then Bhagavan is always by our side. When we, when we turn within fully, we will dissolve back into Bhagavan and we will find he alone always exists. And we are nothing other than that. It doesn't help to always think that he's outside of ourselves or that no, Jesus. Or it that helps. It helps other... to think always think that he's inside ourselves. And he it is help. what we actually are. It, and it doesn't help to think that he's anything other than ourselves, as you just said. Yes, yes. That's how I get confused when people pray to Baba, pray to Ramana, to Bhagavan, and they're really addressing self. Yeah, that is, so long as our attention goes outwards, he seems to be a name and form. So as Bhagavan says, so long as you take yourself to be a body, the guru also seems to be a body, or God also seems to be a form. But what he actually is, is that which is in our heart as I. So when our attention comes outwards, when we find we don't have enough love to turn within, then we pray to him, give me the love to turn within. And then we turn back within. And But we can find him only in our heart. Many people ha- have not understood Bhagavan's teachings correctly. But even among Bhagavan's devotees, there are people who believe and people who claim that a living guru is necessary. They have completely misunderstood what Bhagavan has taught us about guru. Guru is not the name and form. Guru is that which is always shining in our heart as I. So the the purpose of the outward form of guru is only to turn us within to find the real guru within us. So the whole purpose of Bhagavan's teachings is to stop us looking outside, to look only within. So if we... If we, if we are going out looking for guru, looking for living guru, as people say, we have completely misunderstood what this is all about. Bhagavan's path is all about going, going within more and more and more and more. And if at all we feel the need for outside support, what greater support can we have from Bhagavan himself? All the support we need is provided by him in his teachings. So we don't need any other guru. We don't need any other external help. If we keep our mind dwelling on his teachings whenever it comes out, that will encourage us to turn back within. And the more we turn within, the closer we are coming to the real guru, to the real Bhagavan, who is ever shining in our heart as I. That way, Bhagavan was uncompromising, insisting Bhagavan is that, God is that which is shining in your heart as I. Guru is that which is shining in your heart as I. Arunachri is that which is shining in your heart as I. Bhagavan is that which is shining in your heart as I. When he was asked, who are you? He said, Ariyati Tarajivara Dahavari Jagohail Arivairami Paramatma Arunachala Ramana. Arunachala Ramana is that Paramatma that exists blissfully 
as awareness, meaning as awareness means as the awareness I am, in the cave of the heart lotus of all different jivas, beginning with Harry. So from the highest god to the smallest ant, Bhagavan is shiny in their heart as I. So we can find Bhagavan only within our own heart. Uh, I think that is a good place to close for today. Very good place to close. <laughs> Let us close everything. Let us close the outward going mind and turn within. <laughs>